We, uh, we want to continue our study this morning uh, in Genesis chapter 14 in our study of Abraham. Last time when we left off with Abraham, he had come uh, out of Egypt um, and was, was uh, resuming his, growing in his faith in God. When, when he uh, came out of Egypt, he returned again to the things that he had done before. And it reminded us that, you know, there are times when we go down to Egypt in our own lives, when we make dumb decisions to go away from God's promise and away from God's provision. And God is always faithful to fulfill his promise to his people. And in chapter 14, we see uh, another opportunity for uh, Abraham, Abraham to prove what kind of faith he has. Uh, last week, we talked about a generous faith. When he and, and uh, Lot parted ways, he allowed Lot first choice because he believed in God's promise of blessing. And it didn't matter if Lot chose the best land in front of us. He knew that what God had promised him was greater than anything that Lot could have chosen. And so today we see a little bit of the fallout of Lot's choice. But in Genesis chapter 14, it says, uh, beginning in verse 1, It came about in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, Kedoleomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goam, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shanab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. I'm assuming that the king of Bela had such a hard name to pronounce that they just refused to put it in there. So, with me, y'all can take a deep breath because we're going to have to say those again eventually. Verse 3, all these came as allies to the valley of Sadim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Kedorlaomer, but the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year, Kedorlaomer and the kings that were with him, thank goodness they shortened that, came and defeated Rephaim in the Ashtaroth Karnaim, and the Zuzim in Ham, and the Emim in Shaveh Kiriatim. <sighs> all right, we're going to get there eventually, y'all. <clears throat> and the Horites in their Mount Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they turned back and came to Enmishpet, that is Kadesh, and conquered all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who lived in Hazazon Tamar. And the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, came out, and they arrayed for battle against them in the valley of Sidim. Now, let's break that down before we go any further. There are four kings... Kedorlaomer, Amraphel, Ariok, and Tadal. They come from Mesopotamia, far to the east. Now remember, when things come out of the east, it's usually a bad thing. But these were kings in the area where Abram had come out of. Remember, these, these are all kingdoms that are around Ur. And so Abram had left this region a long time ago, but these kings, specifically the king of Elam, Kedorlaomer, had a, a uh, treaty of sorts with the valleys, with the, the, uh, the cities of the plain, Sodom, Gomorrah, and their, their three sister cities. And they paid tribute to Kedorlaomer. In other words, we'll pay you so you don't come conquer us. Well, they did that for 12 years. And on the 13th year, everybody got together and said, you know what? They live way over there. And there's really no reason we ought to be sending them any more tribute. So we're going to stop. And about a year later, when all those four kings on, on the eastern Mesopotamia realized that they weren't getting uh, any tribute that year, they said, you know what? We're going to go take care of that. And to summarize it for you, without looking at a map, on the east side of the Jordan, what the region known as the Transjordan, because it's across from uh, Canaan, is a tr major trade route for that region called the King's Highway. And basically what they did was they came across the Fertile Crescent and came down from the north and conquered everything on the eastern side of the Jordan. They took the King's Highway, which was a major trade route. So they took all that, and that's the, the, the city names that you see there. If you look at them on a map, they start here in the north and they come down on the east side of the Jordan, all the way down to the Gulf of Aqaba, which is one of the arms of the Red Sea. And actually that's one of the places where they traditionally say that the Israelites crossed over. And so he comes back up, and on his way back up on the west side of the Dead Sea and the Jordan Valley, he encounters the five kings, led by the king of Sodom. And they are come out in battle against them in the valley of Sidim, which is a, a region south, a plain south of the Dead Sea. So, four kings against five. 
Verse 10, Now the valley of Sidim was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them. But those who survived fled to the hill country. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supply and departed. So this was common, right? When, when, they would, when the kings would come out of the east, they would secure those trade routes and they would take back goods, right? When, you, when they were, they were uh, conquerors, they would come in and take goods. They would also take people. And so they had overcome this uh, uh, alliance of the five kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and those three other cities. And uh, remember, where did we leave Lot? When Abram and Lot surveyed all the land, Lot said, I'm going to go east. And he eventually winds up camping outside of Sodom. Now, they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, all their food supply, and departed. And they also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions, and departed, for he was living in Sodom. So Lot falls into this chaos of kings. Then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew. Now he was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Anor. And these were allies with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, Abram is on the west side of the Jordan. He's basically stayed out of all of this mess over here. And this is one of the first times we see him referred to as a Hebrew. Now, Israelites themselves never refer to themselves as Hebrews. It's actually a term that's usually in the mouths of foreigners, whether it's the Egyptians or here. So there's some uh, thought that when Moses was writing Genesis, he had an account. Because this account here, these first 16 verses or so, really reads like... A, an inscription about a campaign. When kings would go and conquer, they, they would always brag about how great they did, right? So Keterleomer had a, a great inscription somewhere, I'm sure, that Moses was able to see these records of how he had come across Mesopotamia and conquered the king's highway and as he was coming back up. But here is Abram, who is identified as the Hebrew. Now, usually when the Israelites are referred to as Hebrews, it's when they're wanderers who don't have a land. And when they're raiders. You see the, the use of that word Hebrew a lot with the, in the judges, where there are raiding bands of, of men led by uh, some, of the, some of the judges were, were part of those raiding bands. And so here's what would happen. Uh, they would almost be looked at as mercenaries. They would hide in the hill country and go out and fight. And so Moses is making an intentional connection here when he's talking about Abram. He says, Abram was a Hebrew. In other words, this guy is not to be messed with. Now, this stands in stark contrast, does it not, to the man we just saw in Egypt who lied about his wife being his wife. Here is a man with 318 trained men who is going to go after an, a conquering army that is big enough it has secured the major trade route of the region and conquered an alliance of five kings. That is not an army to be trifled with. But he made one mistake. Kerale Omer and his allies made one mistake. They took Lot. They took Lot. Despite the fact that Lot had separated himself from Abram, he was still part of Abram's family and benefited from Abram's blessing. So, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. That's the promise God made to Abram. So by taking Lot, Abram says, nope, that's not allowed. So he goes after his nephew. And he takes 318 trained men. These are men who were born in his house, it says. In other words, these men were loyal to Abram. These were his servants. These were his workmen. These were the men who, who had been with him for a long time. Abram was not a man to be trifled with. This was a man that God had blessed. And Abram was a, a force to be reckoned with in Canaan. Notice that when Keter is doing all his conquests, it actually leaves the hill country alone. Because the hill country is a place where a small band like Abram's has an advantage. It's a tactical advantage. And so he pursues them. 
he and his allies, Mamre and his brothers. When Abram, verse 14, heard that his relative had been taken captive, he let out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Dan is the northern border of Canaan. And in that hill country where, where the valley comes together, it's very narrow. It's a perfect ambush location. Abram is not dumb. Abram is actually a very cunning warrior. And he takes his 318 men and his allies with him, and they pursue them as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. In other words, he completely routed them. He chased them completely out of the land that God had promised him. Those borders, those, those geographic locations, when you map them out, this is the land that Abram had promised him. And these in foreign invaders, he pushes them completely out of the land that God had promised him. Completely defeats them. Gets everything back. Verse 16, he brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. Now, there's a lot that you can break down there. There's not a lot of recorded history to coincide with what we have here. But there is enough for us to know, one, all of these kingdoms existed at some point. And there is a, a, enough evidence for us to say that this is probably an accurate account. Whether you believe in the, the inspiration of Scripture or not, if you do, that's a settled story. But here is Abram with enough faith in God to risk his life and the lives of his men in pursuit of his nephew. And God blesses him to the point that he is able to, to push out these invaders and, and recapture all of the things that belong to them. Now, you, when you initially read chapter 14 and you see this, this list of nations and kings and all their conquests. You know what they're doing? They're doing the things that nations and kings and rulers do. They're going to war. They're fussing and fighting. It's chaos, right? You and I live in a world where, you know, people think, oh, well, you know, things, borders are settled. No, they're not. There are wars all over. It might not be full scale like world wars, but here's the thing, there are, there are borders that are moving constantly because those who rule those countries can't agree on where they ought to be and want more for themselves. It's a world of chaos. It's a world of chaos. And here's the thing, when the world is in chaos, those who trust in God are a refuge and a rescuer. When the world is in chaos, those who trust in God are a refuge and a rescuer. I want you to look with me first in verse 10. Those who survived the battle of the nine kings fled to the hill country. Where was Abram? Abram was in the hill country. Where did they flee to? Well, one, at least one fugitive winds up at Abram's doorstep and tells him all the news. He is a refuge. Those who trust in God are a refuge in a world of chaos. And when he tells them that Lot has been taken with all the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, he goes and rescues them. Those who trust in God are a refuge and a rescuer. For us, as the people of God, when the world is in chaos... We ought to be a place where people can run to. When people need rescuing, those who trust in God ought to be the first ones to step up. When people are in need, believers are where they ought to be able to run. Why? Because as God's chosen people, which Abram is and so are we, we know that we have the blessing of God. We ought to reflect the character of God. And the character of God is that he is a refuge and a rescuer. So if we are going to be the people of God, if we are going to have faith in God and walk by faith, then we ought to reflect that characteristic of God. Be a refuge and a rescuer. 
and trusting in, in the God who is able to protect us from the chaos of the world. You know, if, if you spend too much time watching the news, you are going to be absolutely depressed because bad news sells and news outlets are going to tell you all about the bad news. You know what the great thing is, though? There is an uh, antidote to all the chaos of this world. And it's sitting right here. This is a place where we come to get away from the chaos of the world and remind ourselves of the refuge we have in Jesus. And because we come here and, and leave those things outside these doors, this is, we, we call it a sanctuary. That's an intentional term. It's a safe place for us to come in and for a little while forget all the things and all the burdens that we have. When people come to a church now, very few people just randomly show up at the door. When they come, they are looking for a refuge. They are looking for a rescuer. We have Jesus who is both. And if you, if you come into this place this morning looking for a refuge and a rescuer, Jesus is it. Jesus is a refuge from the ways of the world. Jesus is a rescuer from our sin and the sin of those around us that impacts us. Jesus dying on a cross in our place for our sin and coming back to life three days later with victory in his hands is a refuge and a rescuer that you cannot afford to live without. So when the world is in chaos, those who trust in God are a refuge and a rescuer. Now you can, you can spend a lot of time looking at the, the, the record of the campaign, and it's fun. I highly encourage it. But for us this morning, if we're going to trace the journey of Abraham, Abraham is growing in his understanding of how to walk in faith with God. So in verse 17, he says, after he, Then after his return from the defeat of Keraleomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley. This is about two and a half miles south, southwest of Jerusalem. And so this is, this is a, a place that would have been very close to what would one day be the center of the kingdom of Israel, where Abraham's descendants would, would have a, a land for themselves. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. King of Salem. Now, if you were here Wednesday night, we did a deep dive on Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7. Melchizedek is this strange figure. He appears here and nowhere else. He's referenced in the Psalms and he's referenced in Hebrews. Melchizedek is this unique figure because in Israel's history, the king comes from the line of Judah. The priests come from the line of Levi. And the high priest comes specifically from within the tribe of Levi from the line of Aaron, Moses' brother. Now, this account precedes all of those. But in Israel's history, there was never a time when the king and the priest were the same person. And that was intentionally so. But here is Melchizedek, king of Salem. That's Jerusalem. It means, Salem means peace. Peace. He is a king of peace. His name, Melchizedek, means king of righteousness, king of peace. And he brings out bread and wine. Now, standard fare for the day would have been bread and water. Bread and wine was royalty. Melchizedek comes bearing a gift, providing for Abram and his men a royal feast. And so as they sat down, he was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of all. Comes on the scene, completely disappears from the record, never to be heard from again. Who is this Melchizedek? He is a king and a priest. Now, there's a whole lot that goes into that later on in, in Hebrews, and you can check that out for yourself. But here's the important thing I want you to understand for Abram's journey. Abram, so far, has been surrounded by people who worship other gods. But here, as he's returning from, from battle, he meets a priest king who serves the same god he does. And when he realizes that this man is a priest and a king, he gives him 
a tithe of what he has conquered. Why? Well, the tithe was reserved for a priest. This, this account would go on to inspire the later accounts of when the, the Levitical priest would receive a tithe from the people. Abram recognizes, here is a man who is in touch with the God that I serve. The function of a priest is to be a, a, a representative of the people to God and of God to the people. And so the appearance of Melchizedek to Abram after this battle is in his mind God sending his representative to him. He blesses him. Right? You have to think of Melchizedek as the mouthpiece of God to Abram. Because that's what a priest was. Priests were to, to tell the people what God wanted them to hear. They would teach them the scriptures and the law when it went later on in, in, in Levitical uh, priesthood. But here is Melchizedek, a mouthpiece of God, reiterating the blessing of God on Abram. And when he realizes that in, in pursuing these, these five kings, or these four kings who have, who have uh, conquered and done all this, God is showing his faithfulness to his promise. Remember? All the way back in chapter 12. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. In other words, he is at work blessing Abram to be a blessing to those around him. But he is also protecting Abram from those who mean him harm. Including these four kings. And being reminded of God's promise... Abram takes all this that he has conquered, right? All that he has captured in this battle. And a tenth of it, a tithe, he gives to Melchizedek. Now, because we don't have priests, we don't understand the connection of what he's doing. He's not just giving this stuff to Melchizedek, the king of Salem. He's giving it to a priest of God most high. He is giving it to God. Because Melchizedek is the go-between. So Abram recognizes that what he has accomplished was not accomplished in his own efforts and in, by his, his own right, but through God's blessing on his life. And because he says, all of this that I have captured, all of this that has come to me is because of God's blessing on my life. I'm going to give a tenth of that back to him. Now, this is where we get the concept of the tithe, Right? that we should give 10%. It's an Old Testament principle with New Testament application. I think the New Testament would actually go beyond the tithe. It encourages sacrificial giving. But that tithe is kind of a good minimum amount goal to strive for. And here's why. In saying, here is 10% of what you have given me, we recognize that what God has provided for us is not ours, it's his. And so we freely give back to him what really already belongs to him. He's only given it to us to steward it, to use it to bring honor and glory to him. And so what he learns with Melchizedek is that those who trust in God are indebted to no one but God. Those who trust in God should be indebted to no one but God. He recognizes that God has given him this victory. And to show that he recognizes it, he gives 10% to Melchizedek as a gift to God. And so he recognizes his indebtedness to no, no, none of his men, none of his allies, to God and to God alone belongs this victory. Because it's through God's blessing on his life that Abram has managed to conquer these four great kings. So those who trust in God are indebted to no one but God. But here in verse 21, the king of Sodom rears his head again. And he said to Abram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Notice the difference between how the king of Sodom and the king of Salem come to Abram. The king of Salem, who really doesn't have any skin in this fight, brings out a royal feast for Abram and his men. The king of Sodom, 
who, let's be honest, owes Abram everything, comes out with terms, demands. Just give me the people and you can keep the stuff. King of Sodom is not a good man, in case you hadn't figured it out yet. The king of Sodom says, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours for fear you would say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me and Ner, Eshcol, and Mamre, let them take their share. In other words, Abram recognizes that he is indebted to God and God alone. And the source of his blessing is God and God alone. And he will not take anything from the king of Sodom. He says, what my men have eaten, that'll be my share. These men who went with me and risked their lives, they should be able to take what they want. He said, but you're not going to say that you made Abram rich because only when everyone looks at my life and sees God's blessing on my life, it will not be because of you. It will be because of God. So, yes, he gave 10% to Melchizedek. But that was God's gift to him. You got to understand in the culture, as, as the conquering hero, Abram is entitled to all the things. He doesn't have to give anything back. He is willingly giving a tithe to Melchizedek, which is a gift, in fact, through the priest to God. He's not in, he doesn't have to give the king of Sodom anything because the last time we saw the king of Sodom, he had either fell into a tar pit or hid, hiding in the hill country. He deserves nothing. But here he comes making demands. Give the people to me. You can have the stuff. Just give me the people. Abram's like, you can have it all. I don't want it. You will not, I will not be indebted to you. You see, Abram had learned something since his time in Egypt. A lesson he is continuing to learn even after, after he has given Lot first choice and Lot takes the best of the grazing lion. Abram is still growing in his faith trusting in God. He says, one, I'm not going to be indebted to you for what God is blessing me. Those who trust in God, trust in his blessing for their provision and bless those around him. Those who trust in God, trust in his blessing for their provision and bless those around them. Think about it. Abram takes all this stuff the king of Sodom can say, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he, he's, he's a great guy. But he's, he's only got all that stuff because I let him have it. Right? He's indebted to no one. Because when people look at Abram's life, what he wants them to see is the blessing of God on his life. He wants to be able to say, I am blessed because God has made me a promise, not because the king of Sodom gave me anything. He trusts in God's blessing for his provision. Clearly, he has enough. He's able to raise an army from his own house of 318 men. He's, all he asks in return for their victory is what the men that have eaten, and for the three men who went with me, they can have their share. He's like, but I'm taking nothing from you because I will be indebted to no one but God and I will trust in his provision for my blessing. So here's Abram. Think about it. Conquering four kings. Rescuing the citizens of the five kings who fled into the hill country and fell into tar pits and absolutely made a fool of themselves. He gives nothing, or takes nothing, and gives to all those around him and takes nothing for himself. Those who trust in God, trust in his blessing for their provision and bless those around them. Everyone around Abram who allied themselves with him 
those who blessed him, whether through their, their alliance and their willingness to go to war with him, or through their provision, like the king Melchizedek, each of them, by allying themselves with Abram, received a blessing. And only the ones who tried to make a fool of him or tried to conquer him found cursing. See, as the people of God, we should be a refuge and a rescuer in a world of chaos. We should be a source of blessing for those around us. And we should be very careful who we are indebted to. Because if we're not careful, those we are indebted to will take the credit for the blessing of God in our lives. In other words, trust in God's provision. It would have been very easy, and Abram would have had every right, according to their culture, to keep all the things that he had captured. But he said, no. I won't have it said that you made Abram rich. Because what Abram has comes from God. In, in a few months, actually over the next few months, there's going to be several ways that I want us specifically as Cowards Baptist Church to put that principle into practice. The first is one that uh, we, we did last year uh, and we're going to do again, where we set up in Waterford Way in Ashford. And there are hundreds, maybe thousands of kids who come through there. And we want to set up and give them treat bags. It's trick or treat, Halloween, with our name on it specifically inviting them to our church. Why? Because in a world of chaos, we want to be a refuge. And when everybody's looking for a handout, we want to be able to give them one. But also, when it comes to Christmas time, I don't know if you know, but Cowarch has a Christmas parade, and it runs right by the front of our property. And we want to make an intentional effort this year, one, to help park people safely in our, on our property, but two, to be out there talking with people, sharing the love of Jesus with them, sharing the blessings of Christmas with them. We're going to decorate the office, set up on the front porch, and we are not going to sell a thing. We are going to give away Water, tea, coffee, hot chocolate if it's nice and cool. Baked goods. Here's the thing. We want to trust in the blessing of God for his provision here. And not take from our neighbors, but give. To show them that God is a God who blesses us. And because he has blessed us, we want to bless them. Not just with coffee and hot chocolate and baked goods but with the gospel of Jesus. Because you see, that's the whole reason God, God moved from world events in 1 through 11. And in chapter 12, he decides, I'm going to bless Abram so that he can bless the nations. Church, we are descendants of Abraham by faith. He has blessed us with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we can in turn share that blessing with our neighbors. God works the same way in Genesis 14 as he does in Cowards Baptist Church. He blesses each and every one of us. First and foremost with life in Jesus Christ so that we can share that with our neighbors. He blesses us with with things, whether that's a, a home where we host people or just the ability to, to smile and greet people and make people feel welcome. He blesses each and every one of us with spiritual gifts so that we can share it and bless others. He, he blesses us materially, whether that's money or things or, or, or influence, so that we can turn around and use those things he has given us to bless people. 
we are blessed by God to be a blessing to those around us. If we do that, if we do that, God will bless it. Do you know why? It's His will to bless His people, to bless others. I don't have to ask. That's confirmed in Scripture. God blesses us to bless those around us. If we will do that, God will bless it. That's, that's not something that dropped out of the air. That's something that's black and white in the Scriptures. That's how God works. Our mistake is so often wanting to see grand and great miracles while not recognizing that the fact God works in and through his people is one of the greatest miracles of all. Look at Abram's life so far. What have you seen from Genesis 12 to Genesis 14? Is God throwing plagues, parting seas, walking on water? No. Through a life of faithfulness to God, he is blessing the nations. Blessing those who bless him and protecting his covenant people from the chaos of the world. So if we will be faithful to be the covenant people of God, to live like God demands of us, to follow his law, to love one another the way he loves us, will he not bless us? He will. If we will trust in God, trust in his blessings for our provision, we can and will bless those around us. Because we are the people of God. We are the ones that God is blessing to bless the nations. If we will be faithful, He is always faithful.